Welcome back, everybody, to Systems Thinking with David Shapiro. You know, today we are diving into something I think you're going to find really fascinating. It's this idea of high leverage interventions. Now, I know that might sound a little jargony at first, but stick with us. You're going to get it and you're going to love it. Basically, we are talking about finding those points in a system where a little push can unlock a massive amount of positive impact, kind of like finding those hidden levers that can shift the whole system in a better direction. And to help us really grasp this idea, we've got our systems whisperer here. You can think of it like this. Imagine you're dealing with like a persistent headache. You could just keep popping pills for temporary relief. Right. But a high leverage intervention would be more like figuring out the root cause of that headache. Like, is it stress? Is it poor posture? Is it something in your diet? By addressing that root cause, that's how you really solve the problem, not just masking the symptom. Mm. That's such a great analogy. And the thing is, mm -hmm. this concept of high leverage interventions, it's not just for headaches. It applies to so many areas of life. Right. We're talking about everything from education to technology, your personal health, even public policy. We're talking about maximizing the impact you can have with whatever resources you have. It's not always about brute force. Wait. Or just throwing a ton of money at a problem. It's about being strategic, finding those pressure points where a small change can create a ripple effect through the entire system. Okay, so I think we've got the basic idea now, but let's get specific. What are some real world examples of high leverage interventions that David Shapiro talks about in his work? I know he talks a lot about education, so let's start there. All right, so one of the most powerful examples in education comes from a study called the Tennessee Star Experiment. What they did was they randomly assigned students to different teachers, and what they found blew my mind. A single great teacher no. for just one year could boost a student's lifetime earnings by like $80,000. Wait a minute, $80,000 just from having one good teacher? For one year. It really highlights just how impactful a high leverage intervention can be. And, you know, think about all the ripple effects. Those students grow up, they get jobs, they contribute to society in so many ways. The impact of that one great teacher, it goes so far beyond that one classroom. Oh, that one really hits home. I mean, I can think back to my own life, and there were definitely a few teachers who had a huge impact on me. So we've seen it in education. What about in the world of technology? I know David Shapiro talks about the printing press, like yeah. the invention of the printing press is a classic example of a high leverage intervention. Yeah, the printing press is fascinating because it really did change the course of history. Before the printing press, books were super rare, they were expensive, knowledge was basically limited to the elite. Right. But Gutenberg's invention totally democratized access to information. It led to higher literacy rates, sparked new ideas, new movements, and in the end, it transformed Western civilization. It's kind of crazy to think about, like how one invention could have that much impact, like yeah. a domino effect. And what's even more fascinating is that the impact of the printing press was actually amplified by something called network effects. So each new printing press that came online and each new reader actually made the technology more valuable for everyone else. The more people who used it, the more powerful it became. Right. So it's kind of like the internet today. The more people who are online, the more valuable it becomes for everyone. Exactly. Or think about like containerized shipping. You know, those big metal boxes you see on ships and trucks. Yeah. That simple innovation. It revolutionized global trade. Because it made it so much cheaper and easier yeah. to move goods all over the world. Right. Or even just thinking about mobile phones. Huge impact. Mobile phones have created entirely new possibilities for how we communicate, how we connect with each other. And that impact keeps growing as more and more people get access to them. Okay. So we've seen how high leverage interventions show up in education, mm -hmm. in technology. But what about in our own personal lives? I know David Shapiro also talks about using these principles to improve his own health. He does. He shares this anecdote about how he made two really simple changes to his routine. He stopped eating after 5 pee meter, and he started going for daily walks. Okay. Sounds pretty simple. What kind of impact did that have? Well, the results were actually pretty dramatic. His stress levels went way down, his sleep improved significantly, and he just felt more energized overall. So he basically hacked his own biology. In a way, yeah. But it's a great example of how even small changes can have a huge impact on our health when they're targeted at the right leverage points. So how did those changes he made, how did those connect to this idea of high leverage interventions? So by stopping eating after 5 p meter and going for those daily walks, he basically aligned his daily routine 
with his natural circadian rhythm. Our bodies have evolved to function on this 24-hour cycle, and when we disrupt that rhythm, it can have all sorts of negative effects. Right, like messing with your sleep. Exactly, your metabolism, your mood, everything. So by syncing up with his natural rhythms, he was basically able to trigger this positive chain reaction in his body. That's exactly it. This is fascinating. I'm starting to think about all the ways I could apply this to my own life. But, okay, we've talked about education, technology, personal health. What about at a bigger level, like in public policy? Can these high leverage interventions work there too? Absolutely. One great example is the Click It or Ticket campaign. Oh, yeah. I remember those ads. They were everywhere and they were really clever because they framed wearing a seatbelt as both a safety measure and a social norm. You didn't want to be the one person not wearing a seatbelt. Right. So it wasn't just about the fear of getting a ticket. It was also about fitting in, mm. doing the right thing. Exactly. And it created this powerful feedback loop where more people wearing seatbelts led to even more people wearing seatbelts. And ultimately, it saved countless lives. That's amazing. And what's really impressive is that it didn't require passing a bunch of new laws yeah. or spending a ton of money. Right. It was a relatively low-cost intervention. That had a huge impact. Exactly. That's one of the hallmarks of a high-leverage intervention. Oh. So I'm starting to see now how this high-leverage thinking can really change the way we approach problems. It's like having a superpower for problem solving. But I have to ask, are there any downsides to this? I mean, if these ideas are so powerful, could they be used for things that aren't so good? Mm. You know, could they be used to manipulate people? That's a great question. And honestly, it's something we need to be really aware of because mm. like any powerful tool, the concept of high leverage, can definitely be misused. Like, think about social media algorithms for a second. They are designed to keep you engaged, to keep you scrolling. But sometimes that can come at the expense of your well-being. Yeah. I know I've definitely gotten sucked into that before, spending way too much time on my phone yeah. when I should be doing something else. So are you saying those algorithms are like a form of high-leverage intervention? Just not a good one. Exactly. They're incredibly effective at influencing how we behave. But it's not always in our best interest. That's why it's so important to develop what David Shapiro calls leverage literacy. Okay. Leverage literacy. What's that all about? Well, it's about learning to see the world through a systems lens. Understanding how everything is interconnected. How even small changes can have these ripple effects. It's about being able to spot those leverage points. Both good and bad. And then making conscious choices about how we interact with them. So it's not just about knowing where the levers are. It's about knowing how to use them responsibly. Exactly. It's about understanding the power of these ideas and using them for good, not for manipulation or exploitation. That makes sense. So how do we actually develop this leverage literacy? Where do we even begin? One place to start is with history. Look at examples of successful interventions from the past, big and small and try to figure out the patterns. What made them so successful? Did they target a key bottleneck in the system? Did they create a positive feedback loop? So kind of like what we were talking about earlier with the printing press and the click it or ticket campaign. Exactly, those are great examples, but there are tons of others. Like think about standardized testing in Japan, back in the Meiji era. Now that might seem like a small change, but it actually had a huge impact on their whole education system. It helped break down class barriers, and it incentivized education in rural areas, which ultimately contributed to Japan's rapid modernization. That's fascinating. It really shows how a seemingly small tweak could have these cascading effects throughout a system. And in another great example is what happened in Finland back in the 1970s. They basically revolutionized their teacher training program. They made a decision to require master's degrees for all teachers. And at the same time, they made teacher education free. Wow. So they really invested in their teachers. They did. And it paid off big time. It elevated the whole teaching profession, attracted top talent, and helped create one of the best education systems in the world. Those are some pretty impressive examples. Right. But they're also pretty big picture. Right. Can you give us some examples of what high leverage interventions might look like at a smaller scale, like within a single school or even a classroom? Absolutely. One of the key insights from David's work is this idea of identifying what he calls rate limiting factors. These are the bottlenecks that are holding a system back. So like finding the weakest link in the chain. Exactly. Once you've identified those bottlenecks, you can target your interventions to address them specifically, which is going to create a much bigger impact than if you were just spreading your efforts evenly. Can you give me an example? Sure. Let's say a school is struggling with low student engagement. 
A high leverage intervention might be to redesign the physical space, to create more collaborative learning environments, or maybe they could implement block scheduling to allow for deeper learning experiences. I see. So instead of just throwing more resources at the problem, you're being more strategic, targeting the areas where you can have the biggest impact. Exactly. And the beauty of it is high leverage interventions often don't require a ton of resources or a complete overhaul of the system. It's more about being smart and targeted with your approach. This is making me think about my own life. Like, what are some high leverage interventions that we can use to be more productive? or to improve our well-being. Well, think about your daily routine. Are there any small changes you could make that would have a big impact on your energy levels, your focus, your mood? Hmm, that's a good question. I know for me personally, getting enough sleep is crucial. If I don't get enough sleep, I'm basically useless the next day. There you go. Prioritizing sleep is a classic high leverage intervention for your well-being. Right. It affects everything. Yeah. From how clearly you think to how resilient you are to stress. Okay, that's a good one. Right. Well, what about your work environment? Are there any little tweaks you can make to your workspace that would oh. reduce distractions, yeah. help you focus better? Yeah. Or maybe yeah. there's a task you're doing that's just draining your energy. Could you delegate it to someone else? Yeah. Or find a way to automate it? Yeah. I'm starting to see how this high leverage thinking can really be applied to so many different parts of our lives. It's all about finding those small changes that can unlock big results. No. Exactly. And it all starts with developing that systems literacy, seeing the world as this web of interconnected systems, and understanding that our actions can have these ripple effects. This has been so eye-opening. I feel like I'm seeing the world in a whole new way now. But before we wrap up, I want to go back to something you said earlier about how high leverage interventions can be misused. Right. That's a really important point. It is. We need to be careful with this stuff. Just because something is effective doesn't mean it's ethical. So how do we make sure we're using this knowledge responsibly? Mm -hmm. How do we avoid falling into that trap of manipulation? That's a tough question. But I think David offers some good advice. He says it's all about aligning our actions with our values. If we want to make the world a better place, then we need to use our understanding of these leverage points to create solutions that benefit everyone, not just a select few. I like that. It's not just about maximizing impact. It's about maximizing positive impact. Exactly. It's about using our knowledge and our influence to create a more just, yeah, equitable and sustainable world. So, you know, we've covered a lot of ground here, but if you're wondering, okay, what can I actually do with this? David actually offers some really practical advice for putting these ideas into action. First, he says, start by really cultivating that systems literacy we've been talking about. Okay. Pay attention to the connections, the relationships you see around you. Notice how things impact each other. Look for those feedback loops at play. So it's kind of like becoming a detective almost, looking for clues and patterns in everyday life. Exactly. And, you know, once you start seeing those patterns, you'll be amazed at how many leverage points you can start to identify. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So we're paying attention. We're looking for connections. What's next? David also suggests studying those historical examples we talked about. Right. Look at how those high leverage interventions worked in the past. Okay. Ask yourself what made them so successful? Were they targeting a key bottleneck in the system? Did they create a positive feedback loop? So it's about learning from the past to inform our actions in the present. Exactly. It's like standing on the shoulders of giants. We can learn so much from those who came before us. That's a great way to put it. So we're paying attention. We're studying history. Anything else? Yeah. The last thing David emphasizes is the importance of experimentation. Yeah. Don't be afraid to try things out. Test your assumptions, see what works. So it's not just about thinking about these ideas, it's about actually putting them into practice. Exactly. The real magic happens when we take these principles and apply them in our own lives. And remember, you don't have to find the perfect solution right away. It's about making small adjustments, seeing what happens, and then iterating based on the results. So it's just a constant process yeah. of learning and improving. Exactly. And that's what I think is so exciting about this whole concept of systems thinking and high leverage interventions. It's not a one-time fix, it's a mindset. It's a way of approaching problems and creating positive change in the world. Well said. I think this has been a truly fascinating conversation. I know I've learned a lot yeah. about systems thinking and these high leverage interventions. And I'm really excited to start putting these ideas into practice in my own life. And remember, even small actions can create big ripples. So don't underestimate your own ability to make a difference. Go out there, be a systems thinker, Find those leverage points 
and use them to create positive change in the world. I love it. That's a great message to end on. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the world of systems thinking with what? David Shapiro. We'll be back next time with another fascinating exploration of how we can use systems thinking to create a better future.